My name is Paul David Power, and I was born with a physical disability. There's not really any name on my condition. Basically, my legs didn't develop at the same rate as my upper body. I also wear leg braces and use crutches for extra support. From when I was born until I was about 18 years old, I had a lot of surgeries, 36 to be exact. And with each surgery, doctors always told me that I was getting better. This surgery is going to make me stand straighter. This surgery, a little taller. This one was going to help with my balance. Growing up, these medical decisions were all made for me. And with each surgery, I indeed believed I was getting better. Becoming more like everybody else who didn't have a disability was very important to me. All through school, I was the only child with a visible physical disability. Now, you have to remember, this was the 1970s and 80s, a time when inclusion was still a foreign concept and um, special schools still existed. But my parents fought and won at the time for my right just, just to attend a regular school. Now, this was a good thing, but it was also a bad thing. My world, from kindergarten until I graduated, was one where I was the only child who was physically different with a disability. This made me feel like a fake, an imposter, at that any moment that someone was going to realize that I didn't belong with these other kids who could run and jump and play without any help from crutches or leg braces. And my coping mechanism was avoidance. I avoid talking about it, avoid naming it, I avoid admitting that there were some things I just physically couldn't do. Now, avoidance worked until I got older. When we hit around the age of 18 or 19, our world expands. We leave the uh, sheltered environment of our home and our schools. We start going out on our own, hanging out with friends, going to parties, bars, considering romance, hoping someone finds us attractive. It's no wonder that at the age of 19, we are more self-conscious about our looks than ever. I was the same way. And the thing I was most self-conscious about, the thing that I considered my greatest physical flaw, was my height. Picture it. Downtown on George Street, that row of bars here in St. John's, Newfoundland, where most of us in our younger days spend some time partying. I remember being at bars with my friends at these uh, four or five foot tables you were meant to stand around and drink. While my friends stood there laughing and drinking and talking eye to eye, I stood there just peering over the edge. I felt like um, a Muppet who was going to pop up at any minute to give some kind of knee-slapping monologue. <laughs> I definitely didn't feel attractive. It was situations like these that um, made me start to hate my legs. I bet everyone in this audience has something about themselves, you believe, if you could just change that, life would be perfect, right? You would be happy. Me too. If only I was uh, six feet tall. I, I pictured myself now downtown by these tables, leaning in a, a sexy pose. <laughs> I would be popular. I would be the life of the party. I would be attractive. But for me, this just wasn't a fantasy because all these surgeries I was having over the years that were always making me better would ultimately make this fantasy a reality. Until then, I would just ride it out. But nothing turns out like we planned. At the age of 19, something unexpected happened. I was told by my doctors that there would be no more painful or scary surgeries, that everything that could be done had been done. Now, to my doctors and my parents, this was good news. To me, it was devastating. How could we be done? We're not done because I'm not better. 
Not when I still stood at four foot eight. I felt abandoned. In our lives, we always reach different milestones. At five, we start school. At 16, most of us learn to drive. At 19, I hit one of my own milestones. For the first time in my life, I took it upon myself to instigate surgery. I figured if no one was going to lead this project of making me better, then I would make it happen myself. And to me, the medical answer to all of my problems was to take away the one thing that was holding me back, my legs. Amputation. I know it sounds pretty drastic, but not to me. Desperate times call for desperate measures. I would take away my legs and replace them with prosthetics. Then I could be as tall as I wanted. And with the right pair of pants, the right walk, the right attitude, no one would be the wiser. But for me to start this plan, this, this cure in my mind, I first had to say out loud what I had spent my entire life avoiding. I lived with a disability. I was different. I remember the first people I told were my parents. When they heard the word amputation, they were pretty horrified, though they did their best to hide it. But despite the shock, they were supportive over what I was saying. However, they also said if I was old enough to make this type of decision, I was also old enough to take charge of my own health care. That I was an adult scared me. At the age of 19, for the first time in my life, I was the one who reached out and contacted my childhood doctor, who had done so much of my surgeries growing up. I thought he was the one who was most familiar with my case, so he was probably the one who could help me. I made an appointment. I can't say that I liked this doctor. He was pretty stoic and serious and pretty much frightened me as a child. But what he lacked in personality, he made up in surgical talent. It's the luck of the draw who we get as our health care providers in our current health system. I remember when he walked into the exam room, he delivered his usual stoic tone. <laughs> Oh, Paul, what can I do for you today? I confided in him. He listened. At least I think he was listening. The whole time I was pouring my heart out to him, he continued to flip through my medical charts, glasses at the end of his nose, never making eye contact. I thought he was going to tell me that I was crazy and should just go home. But to my delight, his first full sentence to me was, we should get some updates, x-rays of your legs. My heart leaped. He also said that he was meeting with some colleagues in Ontario in a few days and would consult with them. He said that his office would get back to me in a week. I was so excited. This was the start. This was the start of my cure. I, I was making a miracle happen. I couldn't wait. I never heard from that doctor again. After months of unreturned phone calls, I accepted the fact that this doctor just didn't want to help me or, or couldn't help me. And the most painful thing was he didn't have the guts to tell me. He was a talented surgeon. He was a crappy person. I gave up on that doctor, but not on my idea. After several months, I found a new doctor, a new orthopedic surgeon who had just moved to the province. And he turned out to be different. I met him, and he didn't flip through medical charts. He didn't take notes. He sat down on a stool and talked to me eye to eye. I felt like I was finally being heard. Now, he wasn't shocked about my idea, but he was pragmatic. 
He said, instead of just rushing into an operating room, perhaps I should do some research on what it's like to live wearing prosthetics. I can't tell you I was totally on board, but I figured if this is what I had to do to make this happen, then I would do it. His office made appointments for me with people in the community. The first one was with Peter. Now, Peter was a man in his mid-30s, and he wore a prosthetic just below his knee on his left side. I met him at a coffee shop. He was athletic, fit, and at 5'11", already towered over me. He was wearing a tracksuit. He had just gotten back from a run. I shook his hand, and I marveled at how he seemed to walk so normal. I shared my story with Peter. At first, I was really, really uncomfortable. I almost whispered. I, I didn't want anyone else in the coffee shop to hear that I had a disability. Then Peter told me his story. He even lifted up his track pants to show me his prosthetic. It was shiny metal steel. It looked like something that would be under the skin of the bionic man. <laughs> My meeting with Peter just solidified how great life with prosthetics could be. Over the next six months, I met with dozens of people who had similar stories of success and active lives while wearing prosthetics. There was a swim medalist, a downhill ski group, a basketball player, a hockey team, through all these meetings, it also proved to me that with prosthetics, I would also become a great sportsman. <laughs> I didn't account for the fact that I never was, nor would I ever be good at sports. I just assumed these prosthetics would give me these magical uh, athletic abilities. <laughs> then I met Edward. Edward was a man in his late 50s who had worn prosthetics on both of his legs since birth. Now, Edward was a big man, heavy set. He had difficulty walking. Edward had to spend some days in his bed or in a wheelchair because his prosthetics just hurt so much. Over the years, it had broken down his skin. He was the other side of the story. Edward also said to me if he had a choice, between wearing his prosthetics or my physicality. He'd rather be me. My miracle cure started to crumble, but I wasn't willing to give up, not yet. <laughs> I was determined. I was pig-headed. I, I didn't want to listen to cold, hard facts. I was 20. <laughs> After all my visits, I went back to see that nice doctor who was also doing research on the side. He sat down with me once again, eye to eye, and he said to me, he wasn't sure after amputation how well prosthetics would work for me because of the unique shape of my upper legs. He said I could be quite mobile on prosthetics, or I could lose the level of mobility I had now. It was a gamble. He didn't say no. The choice was still mine. I went home. I cried. At the age of 20, I probably didn't know a lot, but I knew what risk was. There would be no more surgeries, no getting better, no miracle cure. This was it, and there was nothing physically I could do about it. I made the adult decision. It hurt. I guess part of growing up is when we realize we don't know everything. Sometimes, no matter how much we think we want something, it's not what we need. After a few months, I started talking to my friends and my family about the whole journey. And I noticed something. I was talking openly about having a disability with no shame or embarrassment. 
After two years of meeting with doctors, complete strangers, socializing with other people who identify as having a disability, I had become comfortable in my own skin. Now, my height hasn't changed, but my experience and views had. I realized that my true disability wasn't what I wore on my legs or how tall I was next to a table. It was how I felt shame over myself and my body. Now, this shame impacted how I related to other people, and it also influenced how other people reacted to me. I started my journey <laughs> trying to find a miracle cure that would make me proud of who I am. I found it. If I leave you with one piece of advice, it would be this. Don't waste your energy on things you can't change. Use that energy to change the things you can and know the difference. Once you do that, that perfect life, that happy life you're always looking for, you'll find it. I promise. Thank you.